Max, the question of mathematics, what is it really? Is it something that humans impose on the physical world, much like uh, the system of taxonomy in biology, which seems to work very well and as we classify uh, uh, animals and plants and different kingdoms and all that? Or is it something that is, is out there, it's always existed, and we're somehow let into little pieces at a time that we can, we can access? Uh, uh, how do these two ideas work together, and what's the significance of whatever answer you have? It's very important to not conflate the language of mathematics, which we do invent, with the structures of mathematics, which we discover. For example, when Plato and uh, his contemporaries started getting really interested in how many regular three-dimensional shapes there were with flat sides, they discovered that there were exactly five of them. The tetrahedron, the cube, the octahedron, the dodecahedron, and the icosahedron. And they invented the name. They were free to invent the name dodecahedron, for example, <laughs> for one of them. They could have called it the schmodecahedron <laughs> or the zodecahedron <laughs> if they wanted, but they were not free to invent a sixth one. There is no sixth one. It just doesn't exist. Mm. And uh, it's exactly the same way in physics. When we um, discover things out there and then invent names for them. My, my dad asked me once when I was a little kid, he said, Max, how can we know that the planet Jupiter is actually called Jupiter when no one has ever gone there and, you know, checked? And I went back and thought, about this for a while, and then I came back really excited. Daddy, Daddy, I figured it out. We humans invented the name. <laughs> so what I'm saying in my book is that the things that we have discovered in our external physical reality correspond to things that we discover in mathematics, structures like the dodecahedron, except, of course, much more complicated ones. And uh, this is a... a sentiment that uh, most of my mathematicians friends also share. David Vogan at MIT, for example, has a beautiful poster he's put up on the wall of his office of E8, this mathematical structure he spent a decade of his life <laughs> studying. And he would be really pissed at me if I insinuated that he just kind of made this up. He feels he's discovering it. And of course, if you take two people who both moved to New York and lived there for a decade, right, they're not going to discover exactly the same streets, but they're both going to discover Central Park and Times Square and the main through fairs. And it's the same way if you take our Earth-based civilization and some alien civilization, eventually we're all going to discover the, the basic things like the integers and plus and multiplication and, and the platonic solids and so on. Uh, and then as we gradually map out the map of New York City or, or the map of, of the platonic math landscape where we do what kind of obscure faraway places we find will depend on our cultural interests but we are still discovering rather than inventing. So if we're discovering that that implicitly means that there's something there and, and you define it platonically something in a platonic existence is there and we're uncovering how much stuff is in that Platonic existence. This platonic reality of all mathematical structures is vast, but at the is same is it vast or is it infinite? There are, are infinitely many different mathematical structures. But what's so nice is that uh, it's still not some kind of vague anything goes that anything I can think about exists. It's very hard to, to prove that a mathematical structure is actually self-consistent. And the famous mathematician David Hilbert said that mathematical. Like, existence really is you know, freedom from contradiction. And mm. mathematicians work very hard and, and probably publish papers sometimes just to prove that something actually exists mathematically mm. and it's consistent. So you, and you can imagine in the future writing a program for a super advanced computer to generate an atlas which just has all the mathematical structures in there organized by increasing complexity where on page one you'll have some really simple stuff like the empty set, and then you get eventually to the cube and the dodecahedron, and then eventually you get to three plus one dimensional pseudo Ramonian manifolds and Hilbert spaces and the kind of stuff which we physicists work on now. But it's so much more vast than that. I mean, this is just a tiny, minuscule fraction of all the possibilities. I mean, just in number theory alone, how many prime numbers, if that, if that itself is infinite, that's all out there in, in your platonic space. 
even though there are infinitely many counting numbers, one, two, three, four, five, six, they together form a single mathematical structure, though, that mathematicians like to call the integers. Uh, but there are indeed also vast numbers of them. And it, this raises a fascinating question. It seems like nature prefers simplicity, because it seems like the mathematical structure that we physicists seem to find ourselves in here is actually much simpler than a lot of things that you could cook up. We live in a, in a structure with enormous amounts of symmetry, which strikes us as beautiful and elegant. And this is a deep mystery, which I feel we still don't fully understand. Why is this exactly? So in, in your platonic existence of mathematics, is it the, what exists there? Is it every number, every counting number, every prime number, every even, every odd? Or is it the concept of, you know, take n and add 1 and, and do that dot, 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 n plus 1? The, what, what actually exists there? The mathematical structures that exist in this platonic reality that I call our level 4 multiverse <clears throat> consist of abstract elements with relations between them. And, and this includes, for example... So, so not all the specific uh, generations. The, that's so, right. So the number 5 itself is not the mathematical structure. It's, <clears throat> there's a... It, the name doesn't mean anything. No, the name doesn't mean yeah. anything, but, but, but the concept of, of five things. Or... So uh, some, some, for me, some, some, some popular examples of mathematical structures are different kinds of numbers. The integers are a mathematical structure, one, two, three, four, five, etc. cetera. Uh, the real numbers, the complex numbers. Uh, then there are a lot of mathematical structures that mathematicians call spaces of different kinds. We have Euclidean space, two dimensions with three dimensions, four dimensions, and so on. We have Minkowski space, which is Einstein's famous space-time. Sure. We have curved spaces known as pseudo-Ramanian manifolds, which is the space yeah, that I, Einstein said we live in. So there's a, there's a vast variety of different kinds of... Uh, but I'm trying to understand, structures. within each one of these structures, uh, is it just the description of the structure and a, uh, an algorithm for producing elements within that structure? Or do each element exist in this platonic? Or just take the counting oh, numbers. Okay. So what I'm positing is that we, that our physical reality is one particular mathematical structure of this sort. So for example, Euclidean space is one mathematical structure which has within it infinitely many points, which would correspond to all the different physical points. So you would say this point here corresponds to this mathematical point in this Euclidean space, and this point there corresponds to that other point, and this length here corresponds to blah. And um, we let know, of course, that this is not really Euclidean space because we realize that space is curved and so on. But there is another kind of mathematical structure which known as a pseudo-Ramanian manifold, which can take care of that. And, and, and more broadly, what I'm saying is that for every single physical entity that we think of as something we can touch or measure with a detector, there is a, there is a corresponding mathematical entity there in, in a mathematical structure. So, for example, if you take a thermometer, you can measure a little number at each point in, in the air here, which we call the temperature. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you can measure a pressure with a barometer, etc. Yeah, yeah. And when we make weather forecasts, what we do is we divide space into all these three-dimensional pixels we call right. voxels, right. put this in a really right. big computer right. and try to calculate whether it's going right. to rain tomorrow. <laughs> uh, these numbers are not fundamental, but the magnetic field, for example, that you can measure by holding a compass there and check which direction the needle lines up to, etc., which is also described by a bunch of numbers throughout space, is, as far as we can tell, something very fundamental. Similarly, the electric field, and we have all these other fields which tells us about quarks and electrons and so on. And it's very much like a weather forecast again. At each point in space, we think of there as being all these numbers there. And by putting this into a computer, we've successfully managed to, as physicists, calculate all sorts of properties of protons and atoms and and most other things that we care about. And this is, a, this is again an example of how 
everything here can be described by a mathematics and therefore correspond to a, a mathematical structure. A mathematical structure, I think, is most easily thought of as something which has no properties at all except mathematical properties. If you specify all these numbers, say how strong is the magnetic field here and there and there, and you specify everything there is to say about the world. <laughs>